Good morning, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church, a home in the heart of the city. We're so glad that you're here and hope that you'll involve yourself in the life of our congregation in whatever way you can, because whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your skin color or income level or gender identity, whomever you love, whatever your faith or your doubts, we welcome all whom God welcomes, and that means you. Even in this time of pandemic, there are many ways that you can connect with the life of our church. Today is our last day of virtual vacation Bible school. The children will gather by Zoom at 10 a.m. and the adults will gather at 5 p.m. The children are learning about how to be a good neighbor to the people around them. And the adults are learning more about our neighbors within the congregation by hearing from different members about their life experiences. This evening's gathering will feature longtime members Wiesa Matthews and Janet Stange and Buddy Wortley as they talk about how the church has changed in their years here. We are also, as a congregation, involved in the 21-day racial equity challenge which has been incredi incredibly meaningful. If you aren't already participating, I hope that you will join us either on Sunday mornings at 9.45 in Jay Patton's Connect class or on Wednesday evenings at 6.30. The Zoom links for all of these things can be found in our newsletter. And if you don't receive our newsletter, please email the church office so that you can be put on the list. So, Welcome again, and now let's focus our hearts and our minds for worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Sometimes we are wanderers, seeking a place to stay. Sometimes we are householders, hearing a knock upon our door. 
We serve a God of welcome whose arms are open wide. Whether as welcomed or welcomers, in God we find our home. Let us worship God. In today's call to confession, Romans reminds us that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Our old selves were crucified with him so that we might be slaves to sin no more. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Loving God, you have welcomed us into your household, but we treat it as our own. We bar the door when you call us to open it, narrow our definition of family when you call us to broaden it, and demand that others become like us in order to fully belong. Forgive us, we pray, and humble us. Help us to remember that it is only by your grace that we can call ourselves your children, and that only in extending your welcome are we truly your family. Jesus came not to reject us or condemn us, but to save us. And he did so by disrupting the destructive systems of our world so that we can enter into a new way of life. Here at the Spont, we remember that our old lives have been washed away. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, you are set free. Thanks be to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Christ, all people here below. Praise Holy Spirit and the Lord. Praise Child. Good morning. I hope you're doing well. I'm glad to see you, although I'd much rather see you in person. But this will have to do for a while, I think. Um, I want to talk to you this morning about a word that I think you know. Uh, I hope it's a word that you hear, and I really hope it's a word that you say sometimes. That word is welcome. Do you hear it? Do you ever say it to anybody? Here's a really cool thing. If you listen in church every Sunday, you will hear the word welcome a lot. Terry begins every service by saying, welcome, 
we're glad you're here. It's great to see you. We're happy you chose to come today. Um, and then she talks about we welcome all who God welcomes. And that means you. So that's a wonderful gift. And I hope that you hear that welcome every Sunday morning. I need to tell you that I grew up in a society where everybody was not welcome. The school that I went to and the church that I went to and the people that I hung around with were not always very welcoming. The church where I went, if you had a different color skin than mine, you were not welcome. At the school where I went, if you looked different, if you wore different clothes or you talked differently or you had an accent, you were not welcomed. In the, with the friends that I hung out with, you had to be just as cool as us to be welcome. Now, I'm sorry to say that that was a, very much a part of my life as I was growing up. I'm happy to say things have changed. But you know what? It could go back to that way if we don't work hard at welcoming others. I want to read you one passage of scripture, one verse uh, that you will hear Terry read in a little while. Here's what it says. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Wow. Do you hear what that means? If you are welcomed then God is welcomed into the midst of us. If somebody welcomes you, we are welcoming God. And if somebody welcomes God, we are welcoming you. It's a wonderful gift. And I hope that we will practice it. Because you know what? If we don't welcome people, it'll go back to the way it used to be. If we don't make people know that they are valued and loved and accepted just like they are, then it might not be that way for very much longer. So I hope that you will work hard at welcoming people. When you go back to school, when you go back to church, when you go back to playing with your friends all the time, I hope that you will be a welcoming person because that's what God calls us to be. Would you pray with me, please? God, we thank you for showing us how to be welcoming. And we ask that you help us to be welcoming in all that we do. Thanks, God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as we hear the message of the prophet, we thank you for the grace that brings us here today. As we hear the message of our pastor, Grant us more understanding of what makes up a peaceable kingdom and community. Allow us to be thankful always for the gift of your son, Jesus. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 28, verses 5 through 9. The false prophet Hananiah has just given a very rosy picture of the upcoming invasion of the Babylonians. The king of Judah has been hearing from Jeremiah that things are really going to be gloom and doom. Jeremiah is now calling out Hananiah. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord, and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
passage is from Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. Listen for the word of God. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, said Jesus, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was nine years old when my mom married my stepdad, and one of the most immediate changes that brought into our lives was to our diet. My mom comes from a long line of Iowa farmers, and though she's always been an adventurous eater and a good cook, the general trends of our meals was still pretty middle America. What we called spaghetti, for example, was more or less sloppy joes on noodles. My stepdad, though, is the child of Sicilian immigrants. The first time we entered his parents' apartment, I remember being enveloped by the aroma of olive oil and garlic. That became very much the smell of our home as well. We still had the old recipes that my mom made so well, but now we also had pasta with authentic meatballs. We had Italian fried steak and we had lentil soup I hadn't even known what a lentil was before that. An added bonus, a few recipes did disappear. My stepdad hates liver, so gone was liver and onions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Other marriages have added other foods. My recipe box now includes beef veggie soup and peanut butter drop cookies from my mother-in-law. It includes an amazing collards recipe from my daughter-in-law. And our Thanksgivings now skew more Southern with the addition of cornbread dressing and macaroni and cheese, which I didn't know was supposed to be part of Thanksgiving, but 
Mac and cheese can only make any holiday better. When your recipes become a regular part of the common menu and theirs become part of yours, that's how you know that you're not just a guest at the table, your family. Jesus' words to us today in Matthew are all about welcome. He's sending his disciples out to the lost sheep of Israel, those who have been pushed to the margins. In reaching out to them, his followers might themselves lose the welcome of their community. Doors might be slammed in their faces. Days could be without food. Nights could be without shelter. In the meantime, they were to remain welcoming to others. Even if they didn't have much to give, a cup of cold water to someone in need would be the same as welcoming Jesus himself. So welcome goes both ways. They were both people seeking welcome and people called to offer welcome. And that's the same for the church today. We're sent to welcome the lost into the fold. Those who are lost because they've been pushed out or rejected. In doing that though, we risk rejection from members of our own community who have set themselves up as the gatekeepers. We also risk rejection from those we seek to welcome, especially since we represent a church with a pretty complicated history. Jack Shelton once told me a story he heard from Buddy Moses about one Sunday morning, I think it was in 1963, when the church leaders thought that they might have some black visitors. Buddy, who had commanded an African-American unit during World War II, went to the narthex to make sure that if any visitors showed up, they would be welcomed in. In the narthex, however, he came upon another member who announced that he had a gun, and if any of them showed up, he would shoot them. So there, in the entrance to the church, the literal place of welcome, Buddy found himself between those he sought to welcome and those who were guarding what was inside. Well, no one got shot that day, but I think we can all agree that welcoming someone goes a little deeper than just not killing them. Now, as a nation, we are in a tug of war about what it means to be American. Are we a white nation that tolerates a few people of color as long as they serve our needs and don't disrupt our systems? Or are we a nation that fully envelops people of every kind from all over, honoring different traditions and folding them into the mix? The same tension holds true for those of us who are part of historically white churches. I'm grateful that no one is greeting potential visitors anymore with a loaded gun, but are we really welcoming people who don't look like us? Welcoming them in all their fullness and with a willingness to add their faith recipes into our own so that our congregation can really feel like home for all people? Or do we treat them as temporary guests who are expected to sing our songs and eat our foods without challenging our traditions. I'm struck by the last part of our gospel reading today. Whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. A cup of cold water doesn't sound like much to us. We just go turn on the tap. But offering any kind of water in first century Palestine took an effort. And how much more of an effort to offer cold water? When Jesus uses the term little ones, it doesn't just mean children, though it includes them. It means anyone who is discounted and unvalued. Elsewhere, the same word is translated as 
the least of these. So to offer a cup of cold water to a little one, or the least of these, means that you're making a special effort to make someone feel welcome who is normally pushed aside. You're not just dipping a cup from some stale bucket that's been lying around. You are disrupting your day to go to the well, lower the rope, haul it up, and bring up the fresh, cool, dripping water, especially for them. You're giving them the best that you can. And when you do that, Jesus says, you will receive a reward. So what's the reward, I wonder? Wednesday evening at the 21-Day Racial Equity Challenge, we talked about how the more we read and watch and listen, the more humbled we are by our lack of knowledge. Each of us had thought that we were so highly educated, and yet the history we'd been taught was only partial, and it was whitewashed. In light of what we were learning, Amy and Emily shared a quote from Robin DiAngelo. If we don't interrupt the systems we live within, then we are complicit in them. Then they asked us, what systems are we willing to, to interrupt for the sake of racial equity? Possible systems that they listed were church services, housing, banking, criminal justice, health care, education. That's where the conversation got hard, because we really weren't sure, especially on the question of education. Are we willing to disrupt the educational system of our children in order to make it better for others? That was a tough one, and I went to bed wrestling with it. Then, in the middle of the night, I woke up. We had been making the unconscious assumption that disrupting the systems we have now automatically means being willing to accept something inferior. That changing what we are familiar with means settling for something less, like this would be some sort of a philanthropic sacrifice that we would be making in order to help the downtrodden. And were we willing to sacrifice our children's education for that? Yet, we had just been acknowledging that the educational system we had thought was so high quality had, in fact, failed us. That the system in which we were brought up and which we thought was so wonderful for our children isn't a true education at all. So are we, in fact, protecting a system that's already failing them? Are we guarding the narthex to keep out what we think is a threat when, in fact, we could be welcoming something that would enrich us all. We seem to assume that disrupting the systems of white supremacy means that those of us who are white will have to give up our filet mignon. But maybe what we thought was filet mignon has been liver and onions all along. In other words, when we change up the systems so that we can offer a glass of cold, welcoming water to those who have been thirsty all these years, maybe the reward we get isn't some gold crown in heaven, but a healthier, more vibrant way of living for all of us, right here, right now, no matter what color we are. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, Jesus says. So what are we willing to do to welcome Jesus? I'm sure he's happy to learn the songs that we love. They're great songs, but are we willing to learn his? And Jesus, who seemed to be comfortable at anyone's table, would have been delighted to taste Candy's Nacho Mama's banana pudding. But are we willing to add 
his favorite dishes to the menu as well. Are we ready to disrupt our own systems so that we can welcome a Jesus who isn't the white Jesus? And why on earth would we think that doing so means a loss? Because if we've never had anyone but the white Jesus among us, then we've never actually had Jesus. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, Jesus says. And yet there are many, many Jesuses whom we Christians who are white have been afraid to welcome because we thought the cost was too high. And because of that, we, not just they, have been impoverished and malnourished. Don't you think it's time for us to taste what we've been missing? <laughs>